We're about to resume. I, I wanted to acknowledge uh, the Charles River Associates. They're a sponsor of this, uh, of this program. Uh, so um, I, I did leave them out. They will be featured in the program as well, and you'll get to know more about them. Uh, our topic now is changes at the Labor Board, and we're looking at uh, joint employer issues and maybe the field organization issues uh, that many here in the audience are very familiar with. Fred Braid from the Holland and Knight firm and a member of the advisory board is our moderator. Okay, so change is in the air, as they say. <clears throat> and today, we're gonna... Uh, are you staying up, Sam? To hold up the union sign? <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, we have two distinguished uh, speakers today. Uh, unfortunately, due to a lapse by Sam, there's no union spokesperson up here, but uh, Sam is going to come up and fill that role. Uh, Marshall Babson, to my immediate left, former member of the National Labor Relations Board and currently counsel to the Seaforth Shaw Firm. And Jessica Caston, a partner at Jones Day, are going to talk about some of the changes taking place at the National Labor Relations Board. I'm not going to give a hint as to what you're going to speak about. We'll just start, and I, I know that between you, you've decided how you want to proceed, so let's go. Thanks, Fred. So it seems like every day recently we're hearing in the news about something going on at the NLRB. So we figured that we would give a brief overview of the current composition of the board and then go a little bit beyond what Sam has on the agenda, which is joint employer issues and potential restructuring of the regions, um, and review some of the high profile decisions that have come down in the past six months. So at the end of last year, former chairman Miscamara ended his term. Um, we had a Republican majority board for the first time in years. And that majority with Bill Emanuel and Marvin Kaplan being new members and Ms. Miscamara on his way out, took the opportunity to issue several decisions in the last two weeks of the year um, that basically overhauled a lot of the Obama era board law. And we'll be talking about those decisions later on. After Ms. Gamera left in December, um, John Ring was confirmed as the new chairman in April. So we now currently, again, have a Republican majority board. And just this morning, there were news reports of Chairman Ring speaking yesterday at a Cornell ILR event. Some of you may have been there. But the reports were that, that the chairman said that he is focused on the rulemaking process, which we'll also talk about later on in the, the presentation. Chairman Ring will be here tomorrow as our luncheon speaker. Yep. Um, he's focused on the rulemaking process, which is a method for the board to issue rules in certain areas rather than rely on its decisions. And he also commented that he felt like the, the prior board, the, the Obama board, had focused um, too much and, and, and kind of over broad interpretation of employee rights to potentially the detriment of employees. And he's looking for ways to kind of come back to the middle. Um, and I think we, we see that in some of the decisions that we'll talk about and in some of the GC memos that we're going to address as well. Um, one of the most high profile issues that the board addressed in December in, in one of its several decisions is the joint employer issue. Um, if you follow joint employer, it's kind of like a tennis match. Um, we've gone back and forth several times recently. Um, this all started back in 2014 with the uh, Browning-Ferris decision in which the board held, it reversed decades worth of precedent finding that two employers could become jointly and severally liable under the NLRA if there's the potential for control over terms and conditions of employment of the other entity's employees. Now, the test prior to that was the exercise of actual control. So if you are actually controlling another entity's employees, then you're a joint employer. So Browning Ferris uh, very much broadened that standard, which had widespread um, ramifications 
options for staffing agency relationships and any kind of third party staffing or, or uh, you know, contractor relationship and, and made several industries have to review their relationships with these, these sorts of providers and also kind of threatened the survival of uh, contracting agencies, franchises, and, and uh, other types Excuse of contracts. Excuse me, Jessica, did the board define what it meant by potential control? Uh, well, it talked about the reservation of the right to control um, terms and conditions of employment. So you often see terms in, in very common contracts with staffing agencies and other third parties that give some amount of discretion over the contractor, uh, over the contracting party to either make sure that they comply with standards of the contract, but common language that, be, that could be construed as potentially reserving that right to exercise some control and Marshall was the author of the uh, one of the authors of the brief on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce in Browning Ferris Marshall do you want to talk about some of the arguments against broadening the standard so thank you very much it's good to be here it's good to see a lot of friends and colleagues I appreciate it very much um, we don't see enough of one another these days and uh, Sam was kind enough to give us enough time that I get to tell a couple of stories Sam Thank you. So first my of all, pleasure. I don't know if my everybody pleasure. knows, but Sam and I were in the very same law school class. And since I get to go first on this, despite whatever Sam has said in the past, Sam was one of two superstars in our class. Uh, he and Jerry Lynch. Jerry, of course, is on the Second Circuit now. And the rest of us were just kind of schlepping along, trying to understand what this was all about. And this is a wonderful example that people who kind of schlep along in law school can, in fact, be appointed by the president and become a member of the National Labor Relations Board. <laughs> Distinguished people like Sam and Jerry go on to become judges and law professors. So uh, I, I think that uh, it, it has special significance and meaning for me uh, to be able to come back here today after, I think, I, I know that I went to several NYU labor law conferences uh, then at the Waldorf Astoria in a ballroom when I was in law school. I was invited to come to speak when I was a board member and apropos of some of these changes that have taken place at the NLRB, which repeatedly take place as you're all aware. I'm reminded of uh, one, one presentation in particular and uh, there's a reason for my sharing this with you. Um, the day before I was uh, to speak, there was an article in the, uh, the then Daily Labor Report quoting the then chairman of the NLRB, Don Dotson, as saying that he wasn't sure what all this was about the NLRB having expertise uh, in labor law. He had been there for a couple of years and he hadn't seen very much expertise at all. So somebody in the audience after my presentation said, uh, so Mr. Babson, tell me, what do you think about what Chairman Dotson said uh, yesterday in an interview with the Daily Labor Report? So being the diplomatic guy that I am, and you all know me to be, I said, well, I think he shot himself in the foot. To which Bruce Simon yelled out from the audience, too bad he didn't aim a little higher. <laughs> So uh, I, I, uh, this has always been a very spirited uh, forum and I'm very happy to have the opportunity to chat. I was one of the people who was fortunate enough to hear the, uh, the new chairman speak last night at the Cornell ILR event. Um, I'm not gonna take any of the steam away from what he's going to say tomorrow. I think you should all listen and uh, take to heart what he says. Um, one thing that he did say that I think, uh, and uh, as Jessica mentioned, there were reports this morning about his presentation. One of the things that he did mention that I think is, again, pertinent to what we're talking about today, he, he talked about balance and um, in decision making at the NLRB. And I think that one of the things that some of us have spent a lot of time writing about and talking about over the years, certainly Sam has talked about policy oscillation at the NLRB. Um, you know, what are the bases for making change? What are the prerequisites for making change? Uh, is it just that you have a different view 
um, and, and what latitude do you have? And I think uh, one has probably less latitude than one imagines. Look at this issue regarding joint employer. The reason why I asked to have the brief that we wrote uh, for the chamber to the board in Browning Ferris included in the materials because I think it's a good reminder to everyone that uh, Congress was quite clear uh, in 1935 and again particularly in 1947 that the, the common law of agency uh, was the standard for defining who is an employer and who is an employee. And one of my favorite quotes uh, that I came across when I was working on this, in the House reports in 1947, there's uh, a statement uh, in support of the Congress's reaffirmation of the common law standard. There is reaffirmation uh, of that standard, and, and the comment is, uh, everybody in the United States seems to know who is an employer and who is an employee except the members of the National Labor Relations Board. And this, of course, was in response to the Hearst case uh, at, regarding the, the paper boys and whether they were independent contractors or employees. But I think it's quite clear that the latitude that the board has, whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, whether you're a liberal or conservative, the latitude is, is more narrow than one would think. And if one is true to reading the common law, and Sam has worked on the restatement uh, for quite some time. Um, We're done at this point. Okay, uh, Sam is done. And, uh, but I'm sure that the work is excellent. And the parameters, I think, are reasonably clear. There are some things that I think are quite clear, and there's some things that are uh, 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 clearly outside the, outside the bounds of the common law definitions of who is an employer and who is an employee. And on this issue, I think there's been much too much emphasis on direct versus indirect. There's no question, and, and Sam may disagree, others here may disagree with me, I don't think that there's anything in the common law that necessarily uh, prohibits the consideration of indirect control. The question is, what is in fact that control? What are we talking about? What is that indirect control? Uh, and just like everything else in the application of the test, I think is the telling part of this. Um, there's no question that when Browning Ferris was pending at the board, the argument, this economic realities test, who has the deep pockets, who has the ability to effectively determine what those contracts terms shall be, if there is collective bargaining, that is clearly outside the bounds of uh, employer-employee relationships. And I, I think you'll see if you take a look at the test uh, that I think traditionally has been implied under the common law, uh, you'll see that for the most part, uh, with the exception of Browning Ferris, I think the board has adhered uh, principally since 1947 to uh, the common law of agency. I mean, there's no question where the court would go on this. I remember the last case that I remember uh, before the Supreme Court uh, in which uh, this issue of who's an employer and who's an employee is a town and country case. You may remember that. That's the, uh, the case on salts, union salts. And the very first question at that argument, I was there, was by Justice Scalia. And uh, he was reading from the restatement of agency. He was reading from it. That was his first question. So uh, the board, uh, I, I think, with regard to what are the parameters of policy choices, they are much more narrow than one uh, would imagine. There is no question there are scholars here at NYU and other places who've written extensively about the NLRA and their, in their words, being a statute at war with itself, dual purposes. We have the 35 Act, the Wagner Act, and we have the 47 Act, which cut back in many ways. But many of these choices, and we're gonna talk a little bit later about the speedy election rules and um, what uh, and and micro units, specialty health care, what happened to that in the uh, 
in the last days of the Miscamara <coughs> regime. Uh, many of these are policy choices, and the choices are much more limited than one would think. Marshall, may I interject? Um, I, I notice this panel is a little unbalanced. That's my fault, and I apologize uh, to the group, so I'm going to be the union advocate here to some extent. Um, but what does, what does potential control mean? It, it, if the franchisor is saying expressly that on issues of uh, wages and working conditions, we have the ultimate say, maybe that's relevant. But the franchisor is saying that we have uh, the ultimate say on aspects of the brand management, the way the food is presented, the way you, you, you know, if there's a costume requirement, a uh, uniform requirement. Is that uh, sufficient uh, effective control? Well, under the common law, I think the answer is no. That's my view. Um, and but again, if I, I may say on this, the common, there aren't may, many common law decisions on this joint employer concept. In other words, when you have, um, when you have a franchise or uh, having a continuing ongoing involvement in the business. I mean, so I mean, if we looked at the common law decisions circa 47 and before, we wouldn't get very much guidance, I think. Well, I think that that's right. But on the other hand, I do think that there are limited. I mean, one thing that the common law does make clear is that before you can be a joint employer, you have to be an employer. That's true. That's true. And if, if you uh, are a law firm and you're contracting with a food service company to run your cafeteria, and you say, Sodexo, Aramark, whatever the, you know, Astriker <coughs> catering service, whatever it may be, I want to open at 6 in the morning, I want to shut down at 10 in the morning, I want to open again at 11 in the morning, I want to shut down at 3 in the afternoon and then open again at 6 until 10. Uh, this is the kind of food that I want to have served. This is how much I'm willing to spend uh, on food products and so forth and so on. And that law firm does not engage in the hiring, the supervision, the instruction of those people. Um, you know, is that a law firm, does that law firm have potential control over labor relations if there were a collective bargaining relationship? Now, did the board rule in that case that that was a fit, uh well, in that Browning that would, Fair, that would be a my argument, relationship? And my argument is, I mean, it I think one would be hard pressed, and again, I have a lot of good friends and colleagues here. I think the record in Browning Ferris stinks for extending the rule. Now, there may be cases that are difficult. One thing I think is very clear, if you, if you look carefully at the cases, the board has held more or less without exception that a contractor who retains the right to approve final terms and conditions of a collective bargaining agreement is a joint employer. Right. That, that rule has been in place through Democratic and Republican majorities at the NLRB. That's been in place almost uh, without exception since 1950. Um, and so I think it depends, you know, what, what, what you call direct and what you call indirect. But when I was asked, to, I, I, was, <laughs> I, I wasn't really thrilled about this, believe it or not, I wasn't, but I, I was asked to testify before the Senate Labor Committee a couple of years ago when Browning Ferris was still pending at the board, and uh, Senator Warren, God bless her, was absolutely apoplectic. She couldn't believe that a franchisor who wanted to make sure that a pizza was delivered in 30 minutes was not a joint employer. She said, I've got it right here in front of me, Mr. Babson. Pizza Hut has a, a program, a computer program. And if you're a franchisee and you're taking more than 30 minutes to deliver a pizza, they're gonna call you up and say, what's going on, Mr. Babson? And I said to her, which I don't think she liked, I, I tried to be as, polite as I could, I said, you know, I think if I were Pizza Hut, to Sam's question about the integrity of the product, the quality, maintaining a brand <coughs> stability, uh, if I were, you know, Mr. Pizza Hut and, and Senator Warren had a, uh, a Pizza Hut franchise in Cambridge and she was taking two hours to deliver a pizza oh, to uh, all of her students at Harvard, I think I might say to her, you know, uh, Senator, we're not in the dry cleaning business. We're in the pizza business, and you got to get them out in 30 minutes. Now, how you do that 
is up to you. Whether you want to hire more people, whether you want to train them better, that's your choice. But in terms of brand integrity, we can't take two hours. Yeah, and to that point, Sam, I think what you, your question about what constitutes indirect control was not completely solved through Browning Ferris. There was a lot of open questions about that. And the facts that you're proposing are very similar to what has been litigated in the McDonald's case, which I'm sure you, you've all followed in some respect. Um, and it, it, there's some question about whether Browning Ferris applies in the franchisee franchise or context at all. We've all heard, or many of us have heard Dick Griffin say while he was still in office that he was trying that case under the old rules. He thought that the McDonald's model wasn't indirect control it met the direct control test. So put Browning Ferris aside. Uh, you know, I, I can quibble with whether they were actually looking at the Browning Ferris standard during the trial or not. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the the types of things that that Sam has mentioned, brand integrity, uniform, starting times, um, you know, and this crosses over somewhat into IP rights as well, protecting your brand, protecting your logo, uniformity among the franchises for, for business purposes um, outside of the labor realm. Those were all facts that were con being considered in the McDonald's trial. And I think we're gonna fast forward now to December when the Republican majority board took this issue up in the high brand case they found that the Browning Ferris standard caused a lot of confusion because people didn't really know what indirect control was. And apart from causing confusion at base, the, the majority felt like the standard of potential indirect control or reserving the right to control and you know some of the examples that Sam gave just went too far. It was too broad of a standard. So in December, the board overruled Browning Ferris and in high brand, it said, we're going back to a direct control test. We think it's clearer, we think it's gonna clear things up, you don't have this question about what's indirect, what's a reservation of rights. If you are directly controlling the terms and conditions of employment of another entity's employees, you are a joint employer. Okay, management bar was all very happy, and now we're proceeding under high brand. Until we get to January, a month later, when the charging parties challenged the high brand decision, uh, claiming that member Emanuel should have recused himself because his former law firm represented one of the parties in Browning Ferris. So the NLRB's Office of Ethics looks at, looked into it and found that he should have recused himself, and as a result of that, the board vacated high brand. So now we're in February and we're back to the Browning Ferris standard. Um, Chairman Ring yesterday, I think, and, and has come out um, recently saying that he doesn't know that he necessarily agrees with that decision and that part of what he's going to be looking at is a potential overhaul or review of the ethics and, and recusal standards at the board. Be what it may, Highbrand was vacated. Just yesterday, the board issued a decision denying Highbrand's request that it reconsider the case. So Highbrand is now dead. Browning Ferris is pending at the DC Circuit. Um, the DC Circuit agreed to take the case back after High Brand was vacated, but kind of stayed it until the board finally resolved the request to reconsider and the board made a final decision in High Brand. So that came down yesterday. So we have Browning Ferris <coughs> pending before the DC Circuit. We also have in May an announcement by the board that they're going to um, consider rulemaking and joint employer. And yesterday, um, I think Chairman Ring, uh, or it was this week, it was earlier this week, Chairman Ring wrote a letter to Senators Warren um, and a few others who had criticized the, the potential for rulemaking on joint employer. And in his letter, he was very clear that they expect to be issuing a notice of proposed rulemaking this summer, that he expects thousands of comments, which we all know based on the proposed rulemaking on the changes in, in election rules and, and other uh, notice of proposed rulemaking proposed rulemaking that the board has issued in the past, this could take a long time. This could take years to, to get resolved. Um, but part of his argument for proposed rulemaking versus waiting for another case to come up is he thinks that there are a 
several different constituents that have a stake in this issue. And one of the points he made was, you know, some people may not have the means to have lawyers file briefs on their behalf or may not have the opportunity to be heard other than this public forum of comment um, and review that is necessarily involved when reviewing the notice of proposed rules. Um, Marshall, do you want to talk a little bit about what the, the rulemaking process might look like here? Sure. Let me just mention two other quick things with regard to high brand. Um, first of all, high brand was redecided yesterday as well. So not only did the board um, decline 4-0, member Emanuel not participating, not only did, did they decline to set aside the vacating of the earlier decision, they decided the case again without even talking about the joint employer issue, they decided it on a single employer basis and found that there was a single employer. And um, so that's that for High Brand. Um, so High Brand is a single employer decision and Brown and Ferris is before the DC Circuit. Correct. And, um, and there may be a rulemaking about this stuff. And, right, and I think that uh, it's, it's pretty clear from what the chairman has said and what some of the other members have indicated that, um, that the board will embark on a rulemaking proceeding with regard to uh, this so-called joint employer uh, test. Now just remember what I said earlier because I do think it is true. Uh, the, 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 the ambit for, for, for difference here is really much smaller than people suggest. And I do really, and again, I just want to underscore that the difference between direct and indirect, it really depends on how you're defining it because there is nothing in the, as I said earlier, in the common law that prohibits, uh, in this case, in my view, the board from finding that certain forms of indirect control uh, can constitute employment. So let's stay on that. The, isn't the allegation in McDonald's, I mean, you're more familiar with this than I am by a long shot, because Jessica's been involved in litigation, but isn't the allegation that the franchisor controls so many aspects in the name of brand management, they control so many aspects of, of, the, of the relationship, there's very little room for collective bargaining. There's very little room for collective bargaining, not just hours of operation, but uh, effectively uh, with the control of the pricing and, this, and uh, marketing, uh, there isn't room for collective bargaining. Well, I mean, argument? I think... Isn't that, isn't that the argument? Or, uh, well, that's one of the arguments. Yeah. I think that's one of the arguments. Uh -huh. And I think one of the things that struck me that actually came away from the Senate testimony being a little more positive than I had anticipated, um, I mean, I'm not sure that the present uh, common law standard that Congress made abundantly clear in 1947 uh, applies under the National Labor Relations Act does not need to be re-examined in light of all the changes that have taken place in the workplace. Let Congress decide. Um, is it appropriate for the NLRB uh, to devise new tests that they think deal with situations? If I can just stay on that for a second. It's, Congress did not amend the Taft-Hartley Act to provide for the common law standard. What Congress did was overturn the Hearst decision and in committee reports they said we're going back to the common law agency standard. But committee reports can't change the statute. Well, no, they also, no, no, they did. They, 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 they amended it to provide for an independent contractor without definition. I list the stuff I know. Uh, there's no definition in the statute of what an independent contractor is. And no, they did not, right. but they, they did, did not put the, in the statute. They the, did change the definition of employer. They no. did, they amended it. They amended it. Employer? Yes. I don't think so. But anyway, it's in the brief. I, it's I, in the brief. I have the book right here. Yeah, it's, it's in the brief. <laughs> I, have the, I have the NLRA right here. You tell me where they did I use, it. I use this when I teach labor law. Sam, I, it, it, Sam. Uh, committee it's, reports it's cannot best, change the, the best, statute. It's, yes, the best, it's, it's the best book on the it's market. It's the best book on the market. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> and my students really appreciate it. <laughs> okay. But no, look, just take a look at the brief. I mean, I think it does explain what it is that Congress did. But the point that I was trying to make is, is that if there are, in fact, substantial and significant changes in the way we deploy the workforce and these contractual relationships for a more responsive, on-time economy, so that pe we know that these changes have taken place in the last uh, 40 or 50 years, then maybe it's 
Congress's purview, not the NLRB, to try to adjust these instead of torturing the existing rules to accommodate these new situations. I'm not saying that it must be done, but certainly it's something that uh, I think should be considered. Now, with regard to the question that Jessica asked on rulemaking, uh, I think that, you know, Sam has written about this uh, extensively. Um, rulemaking is a credible and severely underutilized mechanism, as you all know, at the NLRB for uh, establishing the rule. Now, when I was at the board, one of the things that we did that I was very proud of and remain so um, is that the bargaining units in the healthcare industry, the rulemaking mm -hmm. that took place at that time. Um, what was the purpose? I mean, employers and unions were spending a year, a year litigating what are the appropriate units in a healthcare institution. Uh, that clearly is not consistent with the purposes of the statute. So, providing notice, providing a proposed rule, providing a comment period, giving people an opportunity to uh, comment again on revisions that may be made, and then adopting a final rule. I mean, the board itself has had uh, more recent experience with the speedy election rules. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, but I think that this is a process that will not end uh, in August of 2018. It will begin uh, at that time and likely will not uh, end until sometime in the first quarter of 2019. So Marshall, it sounds like the DC Circuit will likely come down with a decision on Browning Ferris and the joint employer issue long before we ever get any rules from the board. It's not clear. I, uh, it's not clear. It's, it's not clear. My firm is now representing Browning Ferris, so I can't say too much about what's going on, but uh, it's not clear what the, uh, the court will do. Okay. Does anyone have any questions on the joint employer issue before we move on? Is the principal issue in the Brown Ferrin case whether indirect control can sometimes suffice? Is that the principal issue? Direct control clearly is enough, but is the issue what forms of indirect control will, will suffice? Well, it's been framed that employer? way, but the record is not a very good Just record a good to case support it. it. Yeah. yeah, the record facts. I mean, I, again, I understand reasonable people can disagree, but uh, you know, in my view, the record was really very scant. And is Chairman Ring suggesting that while this rulemaking is pending, there'll be no further change in the uh, joint employer standards? Is that the suggestion? He, didn't, he did not address that, yeah. And I, w I would assume that's the case. Uh, Could you stand up, identify yourself? Gene Eisner. Um, member of our board. Pardon? You're a member of our board here. I'm sorry. I'm you are a member of our advisory board here. Has the New Yorker challenged the scope of the unit? I'm sorry, 
Has the New Yorker challenged that scope of the unit? They haven't challenged it yet. Okay. So, Gene, the, uh, it's nice to see you, as always. The, um, I don't think the board has had a lot of difficulty in the agency situation where the uh, employer in chief is controlling the terms and conditions of employment and in fact is supervising those individuals on a day-to-day -day basis. Yes. What makes Browning Ferris different, and again, people will, may disagree with me, but in the Browning Ferris situation, the contractor was present at the site at the designated hours, much like the law firm food service uh, scenario that I posited. And the question is, what control, if any, did Browning Ferris uh, exert over the employees of that contractor? If, the, if Browning Ferris in that situation processing waste says we're shutting down the line tomorrow at two o'clock to service the conveyor, we do not need your employees. The board majority in Browning Ferris said, well, you're controlling hours of employment. To me, that's the same thing as the law firm saying, we're closed on Monday, it's a national holiday, at striker food services, we don't need you here making hot dogs and hamburgers. So I don't consider that to be an indicium of, of, uh, of control, but uh, that's, that's what we're dealing with. So in the situation, and I, I, know, I have no knowledge of the New Yorker, I read it. <laughs> Uh, they've had some good journalism recently. Um, but I have no knowledge of what the facts are at that point. They contracted employees for, uh, sent in by the agencies. They all signed authorization cards as if the New Yorker were their, were their employer because they Gene, don't get paid overtime. would you take the mic, Gene? They don't get paid overtime, whereas the person who is employed uh, gets paid by the New Yorker, does get overtime. They don't get health benefits. The person who works for, gets paid by the New Yorker, gets health benefits. So uh, a substantial number of the contracted employees uh, consider themselves employees of the New Yorker and want to be part of the union. Right. Do we have anybody here who happens to represent the New Yorker? Wants to represent the New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do you want to go on to the next topic? Or? Sure. So one of the other high-profile decisions that the board issued in December dealt with how the standard for re reviewing whether handbooks and other employment policies are lawful or whether they could be read to chill or restrain um, protected activity or protected rights. Um, so in Lutheran Heritage, the board set forth a standard that basically said if a handbook, an employment contract, any other uh, policy or rule governing terms and conditions of employment could be reasonably construed by an employee as chilling their Section 7 rights, so their rights to discuss terms and conditions of employment, their right to join a union, their right generally to engage in protected activity under the Act, that, that that those rules would be deemed unlawful if they could be reasonably construed as chilling protected activity. Now, the Obama board really pushed that to the limits, and, I, and I'm gonna give you some examples that we, we've cited in the paper that we submitted. So, under the Obama board, rules that have been found as unlawful ranged from rules prohibiting arguing with your coworkers or supervisors, because that rule could be reasonably construed as saying that you can't talk about your terms and conditions of employment. Um, rules that say that you have to treat others with, res with respect. General civility rules were struck down as unlawful depending on how they were worded because under the, the former board's uh, perspective, those could be reasonably construed as limiting um, protected activity. The failure to maintain a positive work environment. Um, the, if, if you prohibited generally, um, you know, no fighting or no, um, you know, speaking to your manager in a respectful way. All of those types of rules over the past couple of years have been struck down. And, you know, before this kind of very broad reading of Section 7, of what would be a protected Section 7 right, vis-a-vis -vis handbooks and employment policies, 
most of our clients had those general that general language in their handbooks and we had no problem with it so there there was a big undertaking by many large corporations to redo and revise their handbooks and policies at the time um, because they didn't want them to be found per se unlawful um, so this so this has been um, and I'm sure Marshall's had the same experience a, a big area the, of advice that we've been Can given over the question, past couple were of years. these facial challenges in other words the employee or the union comes to the region and says this is facially overbroad, or were they, or were they in review of actual discipline that, that had been meted out? Sam, it's a good question. So both, and what we were finding in a lot of cases is that we would have a charge pending before the board that had nothing to do. The substance of the charge had nothing to do with a policy violation or discipline. But in the information request, the board was asking for handbooks and policies. I see a reaction over there. And guess what? <laughs> the, the the handbook policy or the rule, even if not directly related to the charge, was challenged by the re the, the region as facially unlawful, even if it didn't have a direct relationship to the charge. So, so we saw it come up in both contexts. So this is something that I, uh, and please forgive me, I, I don't, to use a term, so, so first of all, just to back up a little bit, uh, as Jessica and I were talking about earlier, uh, General Counsel Rob, who's gonna speak in a little while, uh, issued yesterday a new post-Boeing um, uh, we didn't memo. get to Boeing yet. <laughs> okay, all right. So, all right, I apologize. And, 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 and Jessica's going to explain to you a little bit about what Boeing did with Lutheran Heritage. Um, I'll, I'll focus on Lutheran Heritage, the Lutheran Heritage rule first, because that's really what I wanted to say. Um, no one could go to the general counsel's office in the last 20 years and sit there and argue a case. And, I, and please, and again, I don't, this is not intended to be an odd hominem con comment, but I always call it the John Higgins rule uh, or standard because John, you know, so bright and so distinguished, a long career at the NLRB as a deputy <coughs> DC, he'd be sitting over in the same chair in the same corner. And whatever the case was, at one point, he would interject and say, well, couldn't an average employee read this rule and be chilled in the exercise of his Section 7 rights? And that, that is what Lutheran Heritage is. Basically, that's what it stands for. Could an employee read the rule and without having been uh, disciplined, without having uh, you know, uh, been spoken to in any way with regard to the rule, could he or she read the rule and feel inhibited in the exercise of Section 7 rights? So again, fast forward to December, um, and the board in its Boeing decision overruled Lutheran Heritage. And Can I just, just pardon me for a minute? And so what do you think the answer to that question is? I mean, I mean, of course, I mean, to ask it is to virtually answer it. I mean, it was virtually, you know, could an employee read it and be uh, chilled? Uh, in many of these instances, uh, the answer would be yes, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, so in the board's Boeing decision, they replaced the Lutheran um, Heritage reasonably construed standard with a two-step analysis. First, the board is going to evaluate what protected activity may potentially be chilled by the specific rule. And then it's going to engage in a balancing test. It's going to look at what the employer's justification was for issuing that rule. So I think the theme here we've seen since the Boeing decision has been issued and Marshall mentioned that GC Rob issued a 20-page GC memo yesterday um, giving guidance on how to interpret Boeing and how to look at policies and handbooks going forward is, is more of a balancing test and more of um, an acknowledgement that in circ certain circumstances, an employer will have the right to balance its interests against the potential chilling of Section 7 rights and try to strike a, a, what, what GC Rob termed as a better balance between Section 7 and an employer's rights. Um, the, the GC memo that he issued yesterday made a couple of key points that I just wanted to share with you. So up front, before he actually gives specific examples, which I think are very helpful, he made clear that if a policy is ambiguous, it's no longer going to be interpreted against the employer as drafted. They're, they're going to go through this, this analysis, so it's not automatically if you have a very broadly drafted rule or policy that, that that could necessarily be construed as chilling. They're going to look behind that. Um, and he also wanted to um, make clear that 
the reasonably construed standard is no longer in place. You have to go through this balancing. Um, he also wanted to, or he did, uh, set forth certain rules that are still going to be unlawful. So if there's a rule that on its face says that you can't talk about terms and conditions of employment or you know, directly in some other way prohibit Section 7 activity, that's going to be unlawful. Um, if there's a rule that was enacted in response to protected activity, so response to potential organizing, response to a strike, um, if that's the motivation, then that rule will also continue to be unlawful. Um, and then, in general, um, if the the rule is broad, as I said before, that, that it's not going to there's not going to be a presumption that it that it's facially unlawful. Um, and some of the examples that he gave of what the Boeing decision calls Category One rules, so rules that are going to be presumptively okay on their face, unless you can show that there was some kind of discriminatory application or some kind of discriminatory motive. But generally, these types of rules, which under Lutheran heritage, the Obama version may not have been okay. Okay, he's saying now, in general, these will be okay unless there's there's a specific issue why they're not. And the the exam some of the examples that he cited were general civility rules. Those are going to be okay. Um, no photographs, no recording. Um, now that some of you may have followed, there was a recent Second Circuit decision upholding the board's. Uh, prior decision that you could pro that you can't prohibit recording in the workplace. So now um, the, the, the GC is taking the position that no photographs, no recording policies will generally be okay. Um, rules dealing with insubordination, so, so um, the kind of the, the rules that we said before had been struck down by the Obama board, but rules dealing with um, not fighting with your supervisor, and acting civil towards your co-workers, not engaging in insubordination. Those on their face will generally be okay. Um, he also addressed confidentiality, rules allowing an employer to exert um, rights over confidential and proprietary information. Um, we've seen under the Obama board some of those uh, types of rules be struck down because they could be construed as limiting someone's ability to disclose wages or, you know, Section 7 protected types of information. Um, defamation, rules against defamation, um, rules against using the employer's logo or ID, which had also been struck down by the Obama board as, um, I think the argument there was if someone's picketing and they use the company's logo, that's protected activity, so you can't have a rule that generally prohibits the use of it, even if there may be IP issues there, um, and generally uh, rules prohibiting disloyalty. So these were all examples that he gave of rules where if there's no nefarious intent there, they're going to be okay. So just one comment about the, uh, the memo is 18-04, by the way, for those of you who look for it on the website, GC memo 18-04 dated June 6. The, 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 one of the things about it that um, is less clear to me, um, he spent some time, or the, the memo spent some time talking about disparagement. And so what I took away from it was, because the, the, uh, the memo takes some pains to make clear that they're not uh, inhibiting the exercise of Section 7 rights, what I seem to take away, and I'd be interested if any of the rest of you have read it, or if when you do read it, what your reaction will be. But it seemed to take the tack that it's okay to uh, disparage as long as you're polite about it. But if you're not polite, um, then you could have a problem. And I, uh, politesse is not something that I just associate with the National Labor Relations Act, you forgive me. Uh, maybe the, the working atmosphere at the New Yorker magazine is different than it is at a loading dock uh, in Brooklyn, but uh, I don't know. So I mean, I just, uh, so I had some questions. I'll be very interested to see what reaction, if any, some of you may have to this um, perceived dichotomy between uh, saying, uh, Babson, you're an idiot, you don't know what you're talking about, and then yelling and screaming at me and saying exactly the same thing. Um, did, did he say anything, did the general counsel say anything about uh, these facial challenges? 
you come in and you show the handbook and say it's capable. Well, he said, as, as Jessica said, there, there, he said there will no longer be a presumption. No, but you can still come in there and make the argument. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Any questions about Boeing or the GC memo? Oh, yeah, the Wait, you, you, need to, you need to take the microphone. We really should reserve yeah, questions for the end. Question. Larry, you'll have to wait one second, please. I'm sorry. That's what we should get to the end. It's coming. It's, make coming. it's coming. It's coming, Larry. Right behind you. Yeah. Thank On you. the New Yorker question, uh, I missed the uh, check off on the standards that would be applied to whether these outside people working at the New Yorker would be employees of the New Yorker. I missed the, the checklist. Well, I mean, I, I, not knowing the facts, I'm just, but generally my view is, is that the board has not really disagreed very much from board to board that if the employer, in fact, is supervising those, those people on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, setting their break time, telling them uh, that your jobs, you're not doing very well, Babson, do better, or this is what I need you to do, that he's likely to be found to be an employer or a joint employer. Excuse me, do you have a question? I'm sorry. Could you repeat the last sentence, Marshall? Um, <laughs> if the user employer, I mean, let's try my hand here. There are two employers, there's a supplier and a user. If the user employer is, in fact, making decisions about wages, hours, or working conditions of the user and people, then he's going to be deemed a joint employer or a single employer. We're not sure of the theory. Is that basically right? Right, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'm not right. sure it can and be a single employer. Yeah, well, no, maybe, it's going to be a joint employer. Well, maybe a joint employer, but I'm not, yeah, yeah must and be, if he's must supervising them on a daily basis. Even, you know, on a daily basis. That's different from the, uh, the franchise situation where it is more, uh, in the nature of the maybe computer controls, and uh, but it's not day-to-day -day supervision. Yeah, so the facts that Gene were recounting at the New Yorker seem more like a direct control analysis versus the indirect issues that right. are coming up in Browning-Ferris. I mean, if they have to do a joint employer test, I think it's Browning-Ferris that now governs until we, ha we have a decision by the D.C. Circuit, another decision by the board, or a proposed rule. Um, but based on what Gene said, it sounds like there's an argument that the right. New Yorker is exerting direct control right. over the contractors that are working side by side under the same terms and conditions of employment, and there, you know, if the New Yorker wants to challenge it, they're going to have to show that they're not actually exerting either direct uh, or not, indirect control. They're not actually doing that. Uh, do you want to go on to the next topic? Sure. So, so one of the other issues that the board tackled in December is specialty health care, which is the appropriate of bar, uh, bargaining units, the appropriateness of bargaining units. Marshall, do you want to talk about that? This is the so-called micro-unit issue. Right. So the... the uh, the punchline, which all of you know, is, is that the board in December, the Miscamara majority uh, overturned, um, overturned specialty health care uh, in a case called PCC Structurals, returned to the traditional community of interest. Now again, because everybody here is a professional and you guys all do this all the time, I'm not going to talk to you in detail about the case, but I think this is a wonderful example of this policy choice question that I framed for you uh, earlier in my remarks. Um, th those who advocated uh, specialty health care and this so-called overwhelming community of interest that one must demonstrate to bring in additional employees to the unit petition for, we all understand that the employer doesn't get to pick the unit and so forth and so on. But query, and I ask the question, remember what this statute was passed to do. Uh, it was passed to protect the right of employees to engage in collective bargaining to, to even the playing field somewhat. But the Congress's primary concern was there were too many labor disputes. There was too much dislocation in interstate commerce. So you look, my favorite example of why specialty health care, in the, in the view of some of us, is inconsistent with the purposes of this statute, the Wagner Act, is because, look at the Macy's case in Saugus, Massachusetts.
the women's shoe department is a separate bargaining unit. Apart from the men's shoe department, apart from cosmetics, apart from, you pick, these are people who are selling, and there was, if you look at the factual record in the Macy's case, there was interchange, uh, there were, the terms and conditions were the same, supervision was subject to the same overall standards. Uh, these are the traditional community of interest standards. Do we really, and I'm asking the question, for those of you who don't like uh, the fact that specialty healthcare was overturned, I mean, do we wanna have a department store that has six different bargaining units, and arguably every six months another contract expires, and there's another opportunity for another work stoppage? Uh, set aside whether there's sympathy strike issues and whether other bargaining units are gonna respect that, the women's shoe department uh, dispute and their picket line and so forth and so on. It just seems to me when we're talking about policy choices that one needs to keep in mind the purposes of the statute. If in fact one of the fundamental purposes of this statute was to avoid interruption with commerce and strikes clearly do that, um, then why would we want to have a proliferation of bargaining units in a department store? I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to comment, there was a very important case, an election that took place in South Carolina involving Boeing. This is a unit of 175. The, the board has a rich tradition of approving craft units. Is that a craft unit at Boeing in South Carolina? I do not know. Uh, is that a separate circumstance that would justify a so-called subunit? Uh, perhaps. But as a general policy matter, I do not see specialty health care as being consistent with the policies and purposes of this statute. And coupled with the speedy election rules, and I have a couple of comments to make about that, uh, I think it really uh, did a disservice to the purposes and policies of this statute. Remember, the 35 Act and the 47 Act. Do you, uh, is speedy election rule the last topic? Or do you? Well, I mean, I just, the only thing I wanted to say about speedy only, elections. Only I because get, I want to, we'll, yeah, take, questions. Just, just we'll very, take questions after. Yeah, I mean, just very. After the discussion I, of speedy I, And election you'll rule. forgive me for doing this. I've, I've addressed this issue before, but I, I really wanted to go back and pull out the language. So what is the, what is the answer? This is the age old debate, right? Uh, when I was at the board, one of the reasons why we did rulemaking in the healthcare industry was because it shouldn't take a year after healthcare employees file a petition to have an election. Most reasonable people would agree that's not consistent with the purposes of the statute. Do we want to have an election in 14 days? Um, to me, uh, the speedy election rules, these are policy choices, mind you. And is it consistent with the Wagner Act? Maybe. What does it do with regard to the Taft-Hartley Act? Well, one of my favorite cases, it's a very important case, U.S. Chamber against Brown. Our, our good friend and colleague Willis Goldsmith argued this successfully in the Supreme Court, did a handsome job. This is an opinion, a majority opinion, striking down a California requirement, you will, many of you will remember, that said if you're gonna do business with the state of California, that's great, but you can't spend any of the California dollars um, uh, campaigning against a union someplace else. So you gotta segregate those California dollars. The people of the state of California don't like employers who are campaigning against unions. That's essentially what it stood for. Justice Stevens, who I hardly consider to be a right winger, wrote the decision, the majority opinion, striking down the California statute on preemption grounds. But listen to what he said about Section 8C and the Taft-Hartley amendments in 47. From one vantage point, 8C merely implements the First Amendment, citing Gissel. And that it responded to particular constitutional rulings of the, NL, uh, of the NLRB. And here it is. But its enactment also manifested a congressional intent to encourage free debate 
on issues dividing labor and management, citing Lynn. It is indicative of how important Congress deemed such free debate that Congress amended the NLRA rather than leaving it to the courts the task of correcting the NLRB's decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, what clearer statement does an NLRB member need to understand that this statute, after 1947, contemplates a free and open debate? And if you cut out the time and the opportunity for a debate, you're not acting consistent with the purposes of this dual-headed statute. I know it's difficult, but it's something that needs to be done. Those dual interests need to be accommodated. The, the, the original question that I was referring to is this argument that academics and practitioners have had for years. When a union files a petition and then the, the union ultimately loses the election, is it A, because the employers engage in unlawful conduct and has threatened and scare, scared people to death, or is it because now they have more information and they're making a choice having heard both sides? People will never agree on what the answer to that is because there are employers who do both, right? We know that. There are good employers and bad employers just like there are good unions and bad unions in that regard. So is your view uh, the board should scrap the entire? Well, it rule? seems to me, or, you know, or, the board has issued a notice mm -hmm. asking for comments. Uh, the chairman indicated last night uh, that those comments were being uh, taken into account. He did not signal or indicate uh, that a new rulemaking proceeding would be underway. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that there are substantial questions mm -hmm. as to whether or not the speedy election rule, and, and when I was at the board, we wanted to try to get elections speeded up also, but not to the point of precluding the free debate that Justice Stevens said is an integral part of the statute. All right, uh, Jessica. Before we take questions, Jean, we will take we will take them. Do you have any any further on the presentation? We also wanted to briefly discuss the class waiver issue since the Supreme Court's decision just came out recently. And for those of you who weren't following, which most of you I'm sure were, um, there was a circuit split, which was led by some cases involving the board as to whether class waivers violated Section Seven and took away employees' rights to. Um, they were relying on the, the portion of Section 7 that says to engage in uh, activities for the mutual aid and protection of other employees. And the board took the position that um, having the right to join a class or collective action fell within that catch-all and that um, class action waivers should be facially invalidated as uh, violating Section 7 and that Section 7 rights should cede to the FAA. Um, and for those of you who have read the court's decision authored by Justice Gorsuch, Gorsuch um, the, the court took a very different and much more narrow um, view of Section 7 and the mutual aid and protection prong, finding that, um, and, and, and Marshall I know has some comments on this also, but basically finding that A, the congressional intent of the NLRA could not have been to include things like participating in a class or collective action under the mutual aid and protection prong because those things didn't exist in the 1930s. So from a congressional intent perspective, the court didn't buy that that was the intent of, of Section 7. And then um, with respect to what does mutual aid and protection mean, the court said that because it, it comes after a string of specific examples cited in Section 7 of what protected rights are, the right to join a union, the right to refrain from joining a, un a union, and the right to engage in collective bargaining, that the mutual aid and protection prong should relate yeah. back to the, the yeah. types of things yeah. that that relate to bargaining and um, union representation and not f foray into litigation remedies under statutes that have nothing to do with the NLRA. Yes, yeah, so I'm just gonna make two very quick sentences because I know we're having a program on this, but uh, so I want everybody here to know that uh, th these limitations on Section 7, which I do not believe are draconian, actually uh, were birthed here at NYU Law School Sam and I uh, had the opportunity to work in the very first We're not case. limiting Section 7, we're giving it its proper reading. Exactly. Okay. Um, 
that's, that's better said, and I appreciate that. That's why he's the professor. And um, Sam worked on that case. He wrote a, uh, 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 an amicus position for the US Chamber. Uh, we had the very first case. We actually had a debate here uh, uh, last year. Cliff Pilevsky mm -hmm. was the first person to argue that Section 7 uh, precluded class action waivers. And this is an issue, has been pointed out, that's uh, been up and down uh, for quite some time. And, um, and you know, I we're, think our arguments are fairly represented in the majority opinion. We're going to have a whole segment on this. Okay. Uh, can you just say a word about the, the attempt to reorganize the regional offices? And yeah, then we'll so take, just. Then we'll take Q&A. Yeah, very, very briefly, um, and I don't have to uh, remind anybody here from the NLRB, the, the um, and I think most of you are familiar with the, with the news reports, of which there have been many. Uh, I know that General Counsel Rob has been concerned that uh, his discussions with the regional directors last January, in which he talked about a reorganization of the regions, uh, became a subject of uh, public discussion. Uh, there have been letters that uh, were written by the regional directors committee to the General Counsel that have become public. New York Times article. <laughs> Correct. Um, there are, um, uh, there are, there's a letter by 56 former <coughs> regional directors. Uh, uh, the, the long story short is, is that, and Chairman Ring talked about this a little bit indirectly last night, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the NLRB's budget was approved at the full amount in the compromise deal that was reached by this Congress, $274 million, the Trump administration has subjected, and I asked the chairman last night where this came from. I think, for those of you who are present, if you think I'm misinterpreting what he said, I think he essentially was saying that this is coming from the administration, from Mr. Mulvaney at the, the Office of Management Budget, that, uh, that the administration is engaging in a practice or a process that uh, some call rescission uh, there's a debate about whether or not it's uh, lawful or not for the administration to refuse or decline to spend funds at agencies and departments that have been allotted by Congress under the, its congressional powers. And uh, so really what the chairman and the board and the general counsel are doing uh, is at this point in time dealing with a downturn in case handling uh, and what they perceive uh, as being perhaps a time to um, re-examine the organization of the board and determine whether or not some other uh, more efficient, uh, more effective way may, there may exist for uh, deciding uh, cases than in the present situation. I think all of us, whether we're management lawyers, union lawyers, we've all benefited from having a, uh, uh, you know, a highly educated, highly qualified regional staff, including regional attorneys and regional directors and ARDs, who look at our cases, who know the parties, uh, and who make decisions in timely fashion. Uh, one of the things that the general counsel uh, posited in his discussion in January was bringing more decision-making authority closer to Washington. Um, each, my recollection is each regional director makes somewhere between 2,000 and 2,300 uh, decisions a year. Um, there are about, I think there are 24 regions now. Uh, they may shrink down to 21, the lowest in many years. But um, try to imagine 20 times 2,000 decisions being made in Washington. That's a lot of decisions. So. What the final proposal, if any, may be, what restrictions because of budgetary constraints uh, exist, uh, we'll have to wait to see. Uh, it's my understanding that both the general counsel and the board uh, have represented not only to the career staff, but also to uh, the public they serve that they will shop these proposals uh, and uh, the potential impact with uh, each of the constituencies, so that remains to be seen. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. I saw my board member, Jerry Kalf, stand up. Do you still have a question, Jerry? I do. Can we get a microphone to Jerry? 
Thank you. You're forcing me to make an observation. Um, Marshall, um, with great respect, um, I'm wondering whether Justice Stevens um, uh, was expressing um, a language that might be considered uh, dicta rather than uh, the holding. And um, I am also wondering whether you're taking that um, very general statement and arguing uh, a very specific thing, and that is the speedy election rule. Um, I, I think that, uh, in general, uh, employers are aware <coughs> of union, don't, don't, don't uh, strike me dead here because I'm a management lawyer. Um, uh, it, it, it seems to me that most employers know uh, quite in advance that there is a union campaign going on and in general uh, use that period of time before a demand is made or before a petition is filed to engage in um, uh, a debate uh, with their employees with respect to whether um, they want unionization. Um, and uh, once a petition is filed, there is a period of time, I know it's called the ambush uh, rule, but I think we ought to acknowledge that under the prior, um, under the prior uh, rule, uh, employers, uh, almost as a matter of course, use the machinery of the act and the administration of the act to delay uh, elections. So um, I, I think that while speedy elections do have, um, it depends on what you mean by speedy. Uh, if, if you said the election was held in 24 hours, then certainly there's no debate. If it's held in 18 days, then there is some debate. If there is knowledge prior to the um, petition, there is or could be considerable debate. Um, uh, and it's one thing to say, let's scrap these rules and go to what existed prior to these rules, and another to say, well, perhaps 18 days is not a uh, acceptable minimum, and or maximum, and let's get to 30, or let's get to right. 35. But certainly, um, uh, 60, 90, 120 days uh, delay through a hearing process and, um, uh, and briefs um, uh, could be considered counterproductive. So I'll just, I think you all can read Justice Stevens yourself. It doesn't matter whether it's dicta or not. It's one of the purposes of the statute. And I didn't advocate 60 or 90 or even 35 days. What I use this as an example of the point I was making about policy choice. There needs to be taking into account uh, these seemingly conflicting policies of the statute that we're living with. All right, uh, one more. Um, I'll, I'll give it to you, Eric. Gene, I'm sorry. Uh, so glad that uh, my colleague, Jerry Kauf, who I've been, my colleague, Jerry Kauf, with whom I've been battling for the last 40, 50 years. Uh, You're wearing it well. He, uh, he uh, took, took uh, exactly what I wanted to say about, I used to litigate before the second uh, 29 and 22 regions on uh, unit questions until the board came down with its rule and I was part of the labor management advisory group under Chairman Gould that started to streamline the time at which elections could, could be held. Right. Um, the employers would take advantage, you don't have to mention 30, 60, 90 Marshall because the employers know, as Jerry said, that they can litigate you till the cows come home about what is an appropriate bargaining unit and with who's eligible and who's not eligible. They challenge people and without, without any rule expediting the election process, every member of the regions here knows that, that they, they will be allowed to, to, to litigate those questions 
and, the, and it will run into 30, 60, 90 days as in my experience. That's number one. Uh, number two, I wanted to address your rule on the specialty health care and uh, separate bargaining units. What I'm concerned about, Marshall, is that I represent also uh, retail workers and uh, they, back in, uh, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, uh, started to file separate petitions in department stores for selling, non-selling, and office employees. And the board, uh, back in, I think in 1965, uh, held uh, that separate units in, in, in uh, department stores for selling, non-selling, and office was appropriate for the first time. Uh, what I'm concerned about is now with the reversal of the specialty health care, uh, whether the, uh, the board is going to rever reverse itself and go back to saying, oh, the whole store is appropriate. Uh, you can't have selling because you don't want to have selling, non-selling, and then you're going to have strikes every six months, nine months, 12 months. Uh, whether or not, in your view, Marshall, do you think that all selling in a, in a store, not just women's shoes, uh, all non-selling would be appropriate, and all office employees who have little or no interchange with, with the other folks, whether you think they would be appropriate? So I, I guess I can answer the question very, very quickly. It reminds me of what Abe Ribicoff said after he retired. I don't have to do that anymore. Um, the, the, I think the answer is yes. I think that the board would uh, and should ad adhere to the traditional standard. What I was complaining about, Gene, was dividing up the selling group among multiple subunits, and I think that's probably not consistent with the purposes of the statute. Sam, Sam, I'm sorry, I just want to emphasize my prerogative here. Yes, and, of course. Uh, let Michael have the last word. I know Michael had his hand up as well. Yes, he did. Thank you. I want to raise the question of civility. Um, and I want to pose this question. If any of us in this room were to set up our own business <coughs> and an essential element of that business, given our personal philosophy would be there can be disagreement, there can be, there's room for argument, <coughs> but civility in my workplace is absolutely essential. Is there anybody who would disagree, first of all, with that notion? That's rhetorical. And if the answer is no, that, that's, that's what should be, we should have the right to do that. And if you then had policy in your handbook that articulated that, uh, would the mere fact that you articulated that as your policy be a basis for finding that's uh, at odds with Section 7? Uh, and if you can point to your practice in terms of how it's implemented in such a way that you know, we don't countenance insubordination, whatever. My concern is that we've gone down a road, and unless the word civility is, is brought back to our workplace, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. Thank you. Thank you. So Fred, uh, uh, that will be the last word for the panel. Please join me in thanking this terrific panel. We have a 10-minute break, and please return.